welcome back to Board to Death Podcast, where we're in for a wheelie good time. I know the pun is terrible. <laughs> I was panicking about that. Uh, so I'm Ross, we've got Mary Jane and Egg with us today, and uh, quite an interesting episode, and first time for Egg here, so uh, maybe we'll start with you and just see how you got into skating, what brought you into the sport. Uh, well, I always found skating appealing. I, was, I started at about eight years old, and I always thought that it was magic. I didn't know how they could ollie. I didn't know what, how they did anything that they did. It was just amazing to me. So it came to Christmas time and I I asked for a, a skateboard and I got a mongoose board. <laughs> Do you remember them? I used to have one. Yeah, I it was my first board. board and it was, it was a good board at the time. Like, yeah, it, it served me well, but as you progress, you want to get better at it and get better boards. So eventually uh, I, I ended up in Aberdeen and I went to Borderline. There was also elements at the time, yep. but I, I got my board at Borderline and it was when I started to progress into it, that it was about my about secondary school that I was getting actually quite good, quite enjoying it more. But uh, yeah, that's that's really about it. And have you been going consistently since then or taking breaks in and out? Well, there was a big 10 year break. A we'll, big... we'll get to that. <laughs> But no, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. And uh, I've seen you on the freestyle board quite a bit. I've been at competitions with you on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been getting into freestyle more consistently. Uh, I, I started again about three years ago. And I was doing street for most of it. And then I, as I as I learned from the Facebook groups, I, I went into F Forum and I found that freestyle was like a, a really lively culture. So uh, the community was really, uh, really helpful and really supportive. So what I did was I ended up buying a, a freestyle setup mm. and I just indulged into it. And I've, I've never really stopped since. Like I've, I've always enjoyed freestyle in a way, but I've never had a proper freestyle board to do it on until, <laughs> until recently. I know, it's good fun. It was good fun, especially coming up to Aberdeen and skating that car park at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. That, was, that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good car park to skate. Oh, I love that place. But uh, no, that's fantastic. And Mary Jane, we've heard your story before. You got into it, but how's skating been for you recently? Um, it's been pretty good. I've been progressing a bit faster, I think, because I'm more conscious of like the way that my body needs to be on the board, um, more so in the last couple of months than like the last couple of years kind of thing. It's like clicking, it's starting to starting to make connections in my head about like the way that like your shoulders have to be in order to do certain tricks. Um so yeah, it's been it's been pretty good and I just got back from California um mm. where I spent some time in the States um and met some amazing people, skated some really cool parks, like some really, really cool parks. Um and yeah, I enjoyed that experience like thoroughly. So it's been great for me. Ah, it's been fun to watch all your, your trips and your, your clips and getting on YouTube channels and <laughs> all sorts of fame. Yeah. And those those pants, those uh, those colourful, multicoloured pants. Oh, the beach pants. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are amazing pants. Yeah, they're cool. Um, I'm using pants as in the... The, the just, American sense. The slang. American sense, just in case this is a Scottish <laughs> podcast, I'll be like, what is she doing? Like, <laughs> skating in your underwear. <laughs> Not, not quite, not quite. Not great in the Scottish weather. <laughs> oh, no, that's brilliant. Well, I don't know if I should give a recap of what I've been doing. Absolutely nothing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bad back. That's, that's all it is. I, every time I stand on a skateboard, it hurts. I went to transgression the other week, knocked myself out. Pretty standard. I seem to always be hitting my head or getting a concussion. So that's where I'm at. Like a full clean kale. It, it, I was out for a couple of seconds. Mm. Uh, again. <laughs> but I got back up and skated the rest of the session, but then, I don't know, my back's still not quite right. I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to buy a helmet because everyone keeps telling me to. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are important. I feel that was the last chance for me. Hit my head after not skating for about a month, and now I need to, to get back on it. There's um, a lot of the Glasgow community I see now, like the younger ones that are suddenly like wearing helmets, and I'm like... It's oh, cool to wear great. helmets now. Like, I'm rubbing my hands over here, like, let's go, like... It, it definitely is cool to wear a helmet. I just, I lost mine and never bought another one. But I've got no excuse now. Yeah. I'm going to get back onto that. I'm guilty for that. I, I don't wear a helmet a lot of the time. Maybe at a skate park or something like that or in an indoor, but I knocked myself out this year as well because I, I fell off the back of my board doing a, a rail stand 
and I'm pretty sure I was out for about two minutes. Oh no! Yeah, which is just on your own. I was on my own. I was just in my car in a car park on my own, and uh, I was on film and everything. But the funny thing is, the camera recorded it, but it skipped when I was unconscious, as if the camera just stopped recording. Kind of like it, you know. Sometimes it moves on to the next, yeah, the next portion of film. So I don't know how long I was actually out for. The camera got a concussion as well. Yeah, the camera got a concussion from watching me. Like it was, it was bizarre. Like, oh no! Well, don't be doing that. We'll all no, go out to wear the a shop helmet. after this. Yeah, <laughs> wear a helmet. All right. Well, we'll transition into our topic. You liking all the skate terms I'm going with here? Oh, transition. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I've been working on the puns, but uh, yeah, the topic today is uh, one close to my heart, and uh, obviously to you too as well. But sobriety. Mm-hmm. Now. I touched upon my journey a bit last time I was on and I've been quite open in blogs and other things, but really want to find out about you two. And uh, I'll start with you, Mary Jane. Yeah, I think my journey in sobriety has been possibly a bit different from the average sobriety journey because I don't think that I had any sort of substance issues or like alcohol Mm -hmm. addiction per se. Um, It was always problematic. Alcohol is problematic in anybody's life. Um, But I think my reason for sobriety was more so the trauma involved in my childhood and Mm -hmm. watching people close to me get absolutely um, hammered and wasted and, like, waste away their lives, you know? Like, so it's more from seeing other people close to my heart that are suffering because of alcohol that I chose to go sober about, and I think it's coming up to a year, so 11 Fantastic. months. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So I was just like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to end up like them. Mm-hmm. I want to be healthy and happy when I'm older. Um, and for all the problems it causes, it doesn't come with many benefits. Exactly, yeah. No, I have exactly. to agree. The, the fun runs dry after a, after a while, and then it's just a, a coping mechanism after that. Yeah. You know, it's, it doesn't go down the right road at, for anyone if they continue to do it all the time i think no i agree with that i agree with that and yeah the coping mechanism i think you're you're spot on there you you have a bit of fun at first or you think you are and then you're just coping relying on it continuing a a negative drive that you just can't pull yourself out of easily Mm -hmm. was there a defining factor for you mary jane that that made you decide or a, a moment um it's more like a build up Mm-hmm. I think of like so it was probably about last Christmas to January and it's probably a build up of things like I gig in bars and venues yeah. so I'm a performer and like I see drunk people all the time and I guess I was driving at that time so I wasn't drinking like a lot at that time anyway and seeing that sober and seeing like the absolute chaos evolving and then thinking back to my early childhood experiences where mm-hmm. alcohol played such a huge part in the trauma that I had to then work through as an adult like it just made sense to me to kind of like and I didn't stop thinking this is going to be forever like I stopped thinking I just need to get away from this for a couple of months and like you know really reevaluate my relationship with alcohol and reevaluate if it's necessary in my life and then it just kind of clicked and I kind of stopped um, my mum's pretty sick at the moment mm. and a lot of that is alcohol abuse and yeah. nicotine abuse for, like throughout her life and she's only 61, she's 61 years old so it's just do I want to be that sick when I'm in mm. my 60s so I think it was just a build up of all that like and then I was just like nah, no, not anymore like it doesn't like I never had, you know, the bestest of fun on it. Anyways, like you said, it doesn't become after it stop. It stops being fun at some point. Mm-hmm. It does. Like mm-hmm. you just end up being like sick the next day and hungover and like three days worth of like pain and anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. three three days was about the hangovers I was yeah. getting and yeah, the suffering, the being sick, the illness, the panic, the worry. The yeah. anxiety can creep up on you after like five days and you don't even realise why you're anxious. But then you think back and you're like, oh, I was drinking, wasn't I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it, can, it can spring on you from surprise like, and you don't understand why it's happening 
That's why a lot of people don't understand their anxiety to begin with, I think. Because mm. it creeps up on you and you can't find the root cause it can, when it's It can that. be delayed. It can mm-hmm. happen days after and you don't realise why. But Because you're worrying about what text you sent to that person and, and <laughs> yeah, what exactly. you said to that person when you're out. And exactly. Or what you said to that person at the skate park. Or like, you know, it's it just, it does end up like... Yeah, yeah. and then people show you videos and you go, oh, no. yeah. that's, that's me. Cringe. Yeah, and you're sort of looking at it going, who's that? And you go, no, no, that's me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few videos still floating about from eight, nine years ago that I don't want to see again. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about you, Egg? What, uh, what's well, your story and uh, journey in this? I started smoking weed when I was about 13. So, you know, mm. I didn't have a good good time in school or well, secondary school. I had a good childhood. You know, it was, it was good up until secondary school where I started getting bullied. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was starting to smoke weed. By the time I was 16, I was taking ecstasy and all sorts of other hallucinogenics and stuff like that. So I was going down a a dark path from a very early age, like, you know. Mm. And when it came into my early 20s, it was, it it got so bad that I was, I was with the wrong crowd. I was up all the time. I was never sleeping, taking drugs, never going to work properly, you know. And it, it eventually ended up in a traumatic experience for me where... I'd been up for five days, wired on, wired on speed, and mm. you know it, it. It changed me forever. I didn't understand it at the time, but I ended up in hospital, and uh, it, it became really, really difficult to cope with, you know, because I, I was I was uh, diagnosed with drug-induced psychosis uh, the, mm. in my early twenties. So, as time went on, I got medication and so on like that, and uh, eventually I got. A bit better, mm-hmm. but I was relapsing constantly. I was I was not doing well in life, you know. I was miserable all the time. Anxiety, I didn't quite understand it and how to manage it properly, yeah. you know. So I ended up getting worse and worse, and then going back into into hospital again, getting a further diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, you know. So things, as time went on, things got worse before they got better. You know, even after I'd been cutting down on the drugs and so on. Mm. So, like, uh, you know, recovery's been a long, quite a long road for me. Mm. Like, you know, I've been at recovery for about 10 years and constantly relapsing and getting better through time Mm -hmm. gradually. But, yeah, I'm still, I'm still, like, ill and so on like that. Yeah. I'm in, I'm doing well now. I've, I've been, I've been sober for about a month now, so. Good job. Yeah. So it's, it's getting better. I just I'm trying not to push it this time because mm-hmm. every time that I go into recovery, I, I I'd go too strong into it. I go I go far too strong and I, I say I can't ever take that again and I, I've got to do hundred meetings a day and so on like that. Yeah. And it doesn't work like that. You have to kind of take it easy and understand that relapse can be inevitable at times. Although you shouldn't push into it, you know if you push too far far into recovery, you're going to tire yourself out eventually, aren't you? Yeah, it's hard to find a balance. I found when I went into recovery meetings, like you say, you over you can overcommit yourself and then cause yourself that extra stress, that yeah. extra anxiety. You just bring in an anxiety into it, and it's good to do the meetings, the recovery process, and oh, go yeah. through it. But you need to strike that balance and be honest with yourself and mm-hmm. take the, the positive steps, not yeah. just gradually, replacing. gradually take them. Because I, I just go too too head on into it and just. Exactly, just wipe myself out with it, mm. and then I, I become susceptible to relapse with socializing and so on, like that. So, there's always temptation around the corner, and that's mm. one thing that I have to avoid is is uh, be putting myself in those situations, mm-hmm. you know, avoid the bars and the clubs. And but it's not so much drink, I've, I've kind of I've always pushed myself away from drink as much as I can because yeah. my dad was an alcoholic when I was younger, and I always said to myself, I'm never going to become an alcoholic. And in doing that, I, I pushed myself further into drugs, mm. you know, so it didn't it didn't work out for me. It's, it's interesting. But like, yeah, I've got to avoid weed. Yeah. We, weed's, weed's the drug of choice for me, and that's that's my weakness, like, you know. I think weed is a very underestimated drug. Yeah. People yeah. ignore it a bit. Yeah, my brother had an addiction to weed, and it got pretty severe, but, like, every time you approached him about it, 
and like tried to talk to him about it, he would like hold on to that. But it's not physically addictive mm, yeah. argument. Like it's like almost like a denial with people that smoke weed. Like, oh, it's not physically, it might not be physically addictive, but it's got hooks that like can yeah. get into your brain and like, you know. Oh yeah, yeah it's psychologically addictive. Yeah. And you know, you become wired to it. If I, if I was to have a smoke, I would start having revelations and think that I've put glasses on my brain and can see better and everything like that. And I'll go down that stretch for months thinking that weed is good for me hmm. until I'm doing it every day all the time and then I become overwhelmed with what's going on. I can't keep up with life tasks and so on like that. You know, so life becomes overwhelming for me. Oh, I've seen, uh, yeah, we, weed is definitely a thing that's been an issue for me. Similar to what you're saying, Mary Jane, you, you're you not physically addicted. Yeah. But th that's the excuse it's that you can always but throw But there out. is a physical yeah. side to it because there's THC clogging into your mm. body. And when you're going through withdrawal from stopping it, the THC is leaving your body and leaving with a, leaving you with an anxious feeling. Mm. You okay. know, so it, it does have a physical effect on you. I agree with that completely. The The first time I realised I'd messed up my life badly, it was drink that led to weed, and then it was weed because I preferred the feeling. Same sort of thing you were saying, it's not physically addictive, it's not physically. Got into debt, I was only 17, owed my landlord rent, completely messed up, and that was the first case of a longer term withdrawal. And like you say, the mind starts playing tricks on you, it was a good couple of months, I had to retreat back to my parents and start over. Mm -hmm. But because I kept telling myself it wasn't a physical addiction over and over and over, yeah. I allowed myself to fall back onto alcohol. That's okay, I'm allowed to do that because that's socially acceptable. Just kept over drinking, yeah. led me into different pills, powders, everything I could find. And uh, I was always an adaptable addict. I could push it to a limit and then pull it back to just drinking where it was acceptable. Yeah, I don't know, it's, uh, I've, I've often gateway. fallen in by by the socially acceptable side of drink, you know, because mm. you think, oh, well, if you get offered a drink, it's not so bad. It's not like you're being offered drugs, but you are. Mm. It you blows are. my you... mind it's still legal. Like, the longer I'm sober, the longer I get, like, really confused as to why this has been allowed to go on for so long. People are allowed to put this into their bodies. When you're walking down Sucky Hill Street and mm. you see young 18, 19-year-old girls, like, spread out on the pavement in their own vomit and yeah. like you're like wait why was this like why have we it's, made this normal like yeah. why have mm. we normalized this yeah that's exactly. not normal no it's it's <laughs> not it's a drug at the end of the day it's it just is. a different kind of form i think it comes down to the mentality of a lot of people i see so many people and they're clearly not addicted they're okay they can have that one glass every week oh yeah, or yeah. A there's meal people or that. that can handle things like but, but yeah. there's a lot of people i'm not one of them yeah. I think Scotland has a problem with like binge drinking too. Mm. Like it's more like, you know, the UK in general has like, you know, when people go out to drink here, they don't go out to drink for like a social drink. They're not going out for like to one glass hammered. of wine and like catch up with their friend and then go home and mm. read a book and go to bed. They're going out to take 10 shots of tequila that come over in a tray mm -hmm. that all have fire coming out them and like and then they're gonna go to a club and they're gonna drink to six o'clock in the morning because that's the way that we we've made that like i don't know it's, it's weird become how it's normal hasn't yeah, it yeah it's become like that's like a normal night for most most people do, do you find especially i found as a teenager i was kind of pushed into it by the people around me oh you're 15 you should be out drinking going to parties oh you're 16 you should be oh you're 18 you need to go into the town yeah. and do this and it was almost like an accolade that you'd yeah. go out and the more drunk you got the more hungover the more money you spent oh, the, yeah. the cooler you were and that wasn't yeah. just in my friend circle that was parents adults family and they'd all sort of look at you and go oh that's that's cool well done you're meant to be doing it at that age but i found that that ingrained into me a pattern of behavior mm -hmm. that yeah. just continued until not not that long ago i've said before i stopped drinking five years ago but drugs kept going and then yeah i'd use any excuse to get fucked up it's like you need to whittle it down mm -hmm. any way you can because the, your your drug of choice is obviously going to be the more the more destructive one for you so to to whittle it down into like i did it with weed you know i was into stimulants and all sorts of stuff and then i said to myself right i'm just gonna smoke weed now and I pushed myself to smoke weed every day mm. and avoid other drugs. But at the same time, when you're doing that, you're keeping in contact with drug dealers. You're under yeah. temptation. You know what I mean? So sobriety is the only answer, really, yeah. for myself anyway. 
It, yeah, I, I agree with that completely. It's been 14 months for me now. Well and I don't know if any of you had similar COVID-19. You said about meetings, I did. It's the first time in my life I ever went to meetings, started going to support groups. Um, Utilised a support group called Dapple in Fife, who are drug and psychiatrist people that give you a, mm -hmm. a meeting once a week to have a chat and catch up and check in and just created the structure around me of positivity and people that wanted to yeah just wanted the best for me did he review to implement anything like that to help you or? i've had a big support network for a long time like so i've been with ada which is uh, alcohol drugs action mm -hmm. in aberdeen <clears throat> i'm not sure if they've spread wider now but yeah i've i've had support from sam h in the past and uh, i've been to na meetings but the, I found with any meetings, I was put off at the first one because they kind of laughed at my story. So I, I, for a lot of years, I, I took that the wrong way. I mm. didn't, I didn't understand why they were laughing at me, or I was paranoid at the time and in hospitals. Yeah. So it was a, it was a hospital meeting, you know. So um, for 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 many years, I was put off by any. Mm -hmm. But that was my own choice and my own paranoia that did that. You know, any is a, a a great group for a lot yeah. of people, and it's it's a, a great support. And it's, it's a way to socialise with people that are like-minded mm -hmm. also, like other addicts, you know. So it's like, I don't know. It's, I find that with support, if you if you rely on it too heavily, it becomes like a life support machine. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to need it more and you start to, you don't develop your own ways of coping. So I've always tried to like have, have support at the right time mm -hmm. when I need it and not have it, not, not rely on it too much. Yeah. so that it becomes like a necessity knowing it's there i think yeah and yeah. utilizing it to help you in the short term is is important oh yeah and and what about yourself because yours your story is a little different yeah, Mary Jane, like, so i'm interested different. to hear what your your opinion is um so no i haven't had any support up until now mm -hmm. um but i did just reach out to a friend after some news i got this week yeah. um to he's been sober for a long time so i've reached out to him to meet up and talk about like how this news might affect my sobriety going mm -hmm. forward. So not yet, but now going forward probably will take a bit of support because um, it's only, you know, I didn't go into it thinking I was going to be sober for this long mm -hmm. and or want to continue it. But now I know for sure that this is what I want to continue. I don't want to ever drink again or, or do anything again like that. So um, I think, yeah, I'll take it going forward. But uh, I think it's really good that that support's available. Um, I know that a lot of my family who have dependency issues on like alcohol and substances use a lot of the support groups. So I've had interactions with them, yeah. but just not for myself, for other family members and things like that. I think it's quite interesting that you're aware of it and at a time when you need it, you're starting to yeah. reach out and utilise it. You've got the awareness of it and... Proactive. Proactive, um, absolutely. I had a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good, I had a I lot of therapy when I was um, like I, in my early to mid twenties, um, and now I know when I need to reach out to people, and I need to I know when I need to take time for myself as well, because I'm quite a I'm quite a given person. I'm quite a yeah. Like I like to make time for a lot of people, but sometimes my weakness is probably not making enough time for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting better at that, and that's why I reached out to my friends to to ask him if he wanted to go for coffee and explain the situation and he's happy to meet with me and you know talk for it so that's really good yeah reaching out is uh it's one of the hardest things and like you say you you can easily well i i, I know i can i can ignore my own needs and yeah. overstretch in other aspects of life and then forget a bit of self-care really and and a lot of people do that yeah mm. yeah a lot of people will put other people before them like it's quite common mm -hmm. and it's quite common especially if you've had some sort of trauma in your childhood as well oh, yeah, that you yeah, neglect definitely. your own needs <laughs> oh, i agree with that completely and uh yeah go, continue with the sort of support it's we're all skateboarders obviously that's yeah. why we're here when i was going through chaos in my life when i was going through sobriety in my life and always on and off and you going through periods i was interested more i'd say in chaotic skateboarders so like, the Andy Roy's, the Brandon Novak, the Bam, Margera, Story Saga, we've all watched. I was very interested in Andy Roy throughout my life. I always thought, oh, he's way worse than I'll ever be. So that was again in the back of my mind. Someone who's in the limelight, 
kind of admired how he was as well. So there was always that part of me that sort of wanted to be like him, but also oh, I'm not that bad, so I'm okay, I can survive. And then I watched him turn his life around, and he was a big saving grace in my life at a low point. I find it quite interesting watching these people, and I take a lot of inspiration, watch a lot of what they do. Is there anyone in the skateboarding world that's helped you just by watching them or that you've been intrigued by their story or journey? Well, I'm, I'm not really fanatical about anything, even... <laughs> honestly, I... I don't know half the celebrities other people know, and mm. I, I don't read up on things too much. I'm kind of stuck in my own world a lot, a lot of the time, so recovery for me was was my own choice. Like, it was my own journey. It, it, it wasn't inspired by anything, because, like, I used to listen to a lot of Eminem, mm. and then when he made recovery, I kind of went off him. I was, <laughs> I was that messed up at the time that it was like it wasn't appealing to me. Sorry, Eminem, you're starting to recover now. You know what I mean? It didn't, it didn't appeal to me at the time. But see, see now, recovery is like one of the best albums I've ever, mm. I've ever listened to. So it's like, <clears throat> you know, you develop that taste for sobriety and and you ha you get that mindset going. It's like a rhythm. You know, you need to start looking after yourself, telling yourself nice things, and looking towards a, a more adaptable future that's mm -hmm. that's sober and, and more stable but like yeah it was sobriety for me was just kind of pushed on me because i needed to do it mm. you know it was never it was never that i looked up to anyone and thought oh i want to be like them or or anything like that it was just kind of I've, I've been stuck in my own world <laughs> for 10 years you know what i mean it's it's just bizarre no i think that's uh that, yeah, you can get stuck in your work. And it's quite interesting you say the album Recovery because it became unrelatable to you. You go, I'm done with that. Yeah, Find yeah. the next person that's relatable to the chaos in your life. and Yeah, that's, that's, I kind of, yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah, I was keeping it alive, keeping yeah. keeping the illness alive and keeping keeping all the, the wrong things alive in my life. But now that I don't look up to that kind of thing, I still, I still respect everyone's journey and everything yeah. like that. But, you know, it's just, it was one of those things that, eventually I became too paranoid and too unwell to not become sober. You know, it, it was it was NA that I started getting into and then after talking about my problems and stuff like that, I did start to feel better. And after I, like, I managed a year of sobriety at one point and then I noticed a difference in myself. Mm. You know, it was, it, was a, it was a journey for me. Yeah, and you're back on it now. Back on the sober journey, yeah. Yeah, I'm um, they back on it. <laughs> no, no, not back on it, back on it. <laughs> oh, dear. and what about yourself? Um, so in the skate community, you sharing your stories has been pretty helpful. I don't know if you knew that. But no, you sharing your stories of like your like sto like your um, addictions and your issues and stuff like that has been really helpful for me. Thank you. Um, but also in the hip hop community, a guy called Darren McGarvey. I don't oh, know yeah. if you know who he is, but yeah. um, he's like an author and I read his book and he in his first book there's a story about his mum and it's so similar to a story that I had with my mum when I was a mm. child mm -hmm. and just like how he links it all together and like explained everything, like stuff I already knew because I had it in therapy, mm -hmm. but hearing it from someone who I've known since I was like 17 and I'm 28 now, um, definitely started to like kind of inspire me a bit as well to be like well actually he makes a lot of really good points mm, yeah <laughs> uh, is this like is this what i want like when i have children is that the the life that i want to give them mm -hmm. um because unfortunately i have to now know that it's you know there's a genetic i don't know if it's genetic but there's some sort of component in my family that makes us susceptible to addictions and alcohol misuse because yeah. like every single one in my family has an addiction it's not one of them that's spared one mm. like whether it's nicotine alcohol drugs like everybody in my family everyone extended like yeah. I just so i need to be aware of that and i need to be conscious of that moving forward so he inspired me quite a bit and then in the skate community, you sharing your stories and a couple of other people I think have shared stories of sobriety and skateboarding. Mm -hmm. um, Laura Green from Oxford. Yes. Yes. Uh, her sharing her, like, well, not all her story, but her saying mm -hmm. that she's a sober skater and Liam um, as well. So a couple of other people that uh, I know that skate that are sober and just knowing that they have done it as well is like kind of mm. like, you know, makes me feel more validated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I think it's not spoken about as much as it could be in skateboarding and that can be a scary concept. There was a long yeah. period of time where it was not it was the cool thing to go out with a crate of beer, skate and then or just buy whatever you could and skate. It, it, pills and skating were very big in my mid twenties. You know, we you couldn't even go out on a board without wow. taking something. Mm. And I tried I'd, never to mix it. I oh, I, well, I loved with mixing weed, it I would and that feel was the worst inspired, thing. But- yeah, if I, I started getting more wasted into my 20s and then skateboarding just started fading away mm-hmm. as I got into it. And that was your 10-year break. That was my 10-year yeah, break. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so we've got there now, but uh, yeah, uh, 10 years of just absolute mess in my head and mess in my life, but eventually I got over it. I got back into skateboarding and that was a big that was a big influence on my recovery. Yeah. You know, the support you receive in, in the skateboarding community is like no other, you know. I agree with that. I, I followed you in the midst of the worst point in my life on Instagram. And I was watching you skate and a few other people. And it was just good to have that nice, positive outlet. Because you messaged me and Doric Skateboards and a few other guys, Dan, and all of that. And even though everything was a bit chaotic for me at that time, especially during the lockdown period with everything that was going on. Yeah. No matter what was happening at the time, skateboarding was still that little bit of good. Yeah. If I could get on it, I could forget what, not forget what was going on in your life, but you could enjoy an aspect of life that was still quite, for me, pure, simple, mm-hmm. enjoyable until you break a bone or two. And then you think, oh, everything's rubbish. But aside from that, it was uh, it was always enjoyable. Well, and what you were saying about mixing skateboarding and alcohol, I did that and broke my ankle. So yeah, yeah I had, had two glasses of wine when I dropped in that loading bay bowl when I broke my <laughs> ankle in two places. Oh no. And um, yeah, like a lot of people probably don't know that, that that was what happened. But like, I mean, I don't think I was drunk, but then you look back on mm. it and you're like, well, maybe actually it did impair my yeah. balance a little bit because like I dropped in that bowl many a times before yeah. and I was fine. Yeah, the, the four breaks that I had in that one year, I was out with my face on everything Were that I could. Be, yeah, and you look back and you go, oh, I thought I was in control, but would that have happened if I was sober? Yeah. And I have to say, probably not. I would have been more cautious. I would have considered what I was doing. I would have maybe built up to certain tricks. And it definitely, it definitely takes away inhibitions and then you make mistakes and it can be deadly. That's it's, really interesting. Yeah. It, it's... Like terrifying to look back on because <laughs> you see a lot of the shredders in the community and i see them at events and they're 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 down in beers like at the side of like the the bowl and they're dropping in that eight foot ten foot section yeah. and i'm just like wait a minute like yeah it's it's wild that they can still do that like mm. and you know it's scary it, it can be yeah and yeah, I'm glad that I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I've retired into freestyle because I would just end up making a mess of myself if I didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Down sets or oh, no. No, no, stair sets are not fun even. No, even not after you're thirty. No. Yeah, thirty plus yeah, that's it when hurts you start. a lot more than your bones. <laughs> sober or drunk. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's you won't do it. I just don't do it sober. <laughs> <laughs> Your, like I say, your story is a little different. It's more, it's interesting to me because it's coming from a different aspect. What advice or good bit of support would you give to people that are considering making a change in their life or making a positive change in their life, whether it be with alcohol, drugs, or a sport or an activity or anything? That's interesting. Um, hold on, I need to think about it. Oh, that's all right. Well, we can go to egg first. Yeah, let's go well, to egg first and okay, then, yeah. Um, well, I, I'd say, like, recovery and sobriety, you can't force or make anyone want it. Mm-hmm. They have to want it for themselves. Agreed. You know, because there's a denial that's played in it. And uh, you can't you can't break a person's denial. You just have to let them run their course and find their own way mm-hmm. of dealing with things. Like, you know, you can't, you can't force people into sobriety and make them think that this is... Mm. This is for them or that. It's 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 about their own journey and their own experience. I'd say, you know, they have to find it for themselves. I had to anyway. Yeah, I have to say that's. Uh, I agree with that completely. I'd say the the one thing I would say is don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's Communicate. no. It's no weakness. It doesn't make you frail or no way small or, or weak, which is what I always used to fear. If you're going down the wrong path with the wrong people, 
they're obviously the wrong people. Mm. You just need to know when not to stay too long and not to yeah. not to go down that road that they're going because you know it's easily done. I've done it before. So, you know, I, it's so sad because they're not the, they're not necessarily the wrong people either. They're also battling mm. demons and yeah, dealing exactly. with things. It's an illness as at well, the end of the day. which is really sad. It's just you've got to do what's right for you, and you've got to part ways with that person until mm -hmm. you can be more clearer in your head. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. There's no one person at the same stage in recovery. We're all unique in our different mm. ways. Yeah. You know, we're all at different stages. We're all, we've all got different clean times and non-clean times, mm. whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's a completely unique experience where you have to find your own way through sobriety because you're dealing with different substance, substances. Not everyone's got the same addiction and not everyone's got the same pattern of addiction and, and coping mechanisms. Uh. You've got to think of the addictions that are not like substance and alcohol as well. You've got gambling and oh, you've yeah. got Everything. like food. Food is mm. something yeah. that, that that people get addicted to and like mm -hmm. all these other things like, you know, so there's there's other addictions out there as well yeah. that like anything that basically just makes your brain go wee. <laughs> yeah. well, what would you say to those people? What can they do, Mary Jane? Going back to you. Uh, I think my advice, you asked what my advice yeah. would be um, for anyone wanting to make a positive change um, is that it's never too late because yeah. my mum and family always go, oh, it's too late for me. Oh, I shouldn't stop that. It's too late for mm. me. The damage is done. No, like it's never too late. Like you can be, you know, in your 40s, 50s, 60s and mm -hmm. you can still make a positive change in I your life. That. Or you can do it even earlier. You can do it when you're a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, you know. Mm. If you want to make a change in your life, make it. And don't think to yourself, oh, it's too late because I'm already, you know, mm. like knee-high in debt or I'm already, you know, drinking every single day. Like, yeah. it's never too late. There's no, you can't, you can always bring it back. You can always bring it back and then like make that. that change for yourself. I think that's... The perfect way to start wrapping this up. I think that that is the <laughs> perfect bit of advice. It's me. never too late. It's, it's never, never too late. late. <laughs> and uh, I like that. But yeah, we are coming to the end of it now. And uh, it's been a great session with you both. I've really enjoyed doing this. And I just want to thank John T for allowing me to, to host this and, and just you two for being here. It's always Bye. nice having friendly faces in front of me. But uh, we have the important question now Song of the Day. Oh no, I've got mine ready. I forgot about this part. I've got mine ready, so I'll go first and then yeah. we'll go around the room. So I'm going to go with Feeder, Just a Day, because that song's been with me from a young teenager. Good and bad, I always seem to resort back to that song. And there's a good message, it's about... Uh, well, there is a good message in there if you listen for it, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, there is for me, but yeah, that's my favourite at the moment. So... Egg, what about you? I'm just going to be so predictable and say the drugs don't work by the verve. Brilliant. I honestly, I racked my mind for a good sobriety song, but nothing fits better. Perfect. And Mary um, Jane. Marissa Mino and her song, Growing Up, Growing Old Can Go to Hell. And there's a line in it where she says, remember when we didn't have to do any drugs to have fun. And I oh. thought about like the the childhood days where you'd just be jumping mid like middens. I don't know if you guys had them. Like like the backs, like and like these tenement houses had like these bins and like they they had concrete on them and you would jump from one side to the yeah, other yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, and you just you'd be having fun but without Yeah. Yeah. You know, without all the, the alcohol and the drugs and it that song that, doesn't it? sounds like it reminds me of that. So Fantastic. Yeah. Well that is us. Come to the end of the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know who else to thank. Just thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you, everyone, thank for you listening. Skateboarding. Yeah. <laughs>